happiness is beautiful It's a kind of reality Happiness is the highest good Happiness is free So let's be so very happy Yeah, let's be so very happy Yeah, let's be so very happy Welcome to The Happiness Show. This is Lionel Ketchian, and I'm here with George Ortega, and we're here to talk about happiness. Because happiness is, always has been, and always will be, the point of it all. Today we'll be talking about Barbara Holstein's Seven Gateways to Happiness. Welcome, Barbara, to our show. Oh, I'm so delighted to be here, and this is such great fun. I really should be calling you Doctor. Barbara Holston. Whatever you like, we're such friends already. The exactly. magnetism is just going <laughs> around. So whatever works. Okay, so you are a, a PhD. I actually psychology. have an EDD, which is a doctorate in education. Uh -huh. I'm licensed in New Jersey as a private practice psychologist. Right. I've been in practice over 20 years with my dear husband, Dr. Mm -hmm. Russell Holstein. And yeah. uh, it goes from there. Great. Now, how long have you been doing your thing? I've been doing my thing as a positive psychologist, reaching out with a concept I call the enchanted self for about 12 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you a very quick sketch of how this happened. I was in private practice and I became concerned. I really felt something was wrong in mental health care in this country that there was too much emphasis on pathology, on the disease model, and that a client would come in, even to a well-intentioned psychologist, and say, look, I have this wrong, this is not working, I feel this way, that way, and the psychologist would say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and then toward the end of the session, he or she might say, well, it seems that you have this and you have that, and we want to work on this, we want to work on that, and you sort of drag out of the office, oh, I feel even worse. And I felt there's something wrong, there's just something wrong in this nut to crack, it doesn't feel right. And so intuitively I went out and I researched women who were not in my practice. I started asking them all sorts of questions. When do you feel bad? When do you feel good? When do you feel down because someone's criticized you? And I learned a lot about women. I learned that women are easily wounded, that we do take criticism very personally. And yet, we all seem to have a capacity for happiness. The trouble was the capacity for happiness was underestimated and tossed aside even by the women I interviewed. I had to like frame it, help them stay on the topic. Oh, you love to ski, tell me more about it. You know, they weren't necessarily clear because there's almost this sort of dismissive attitude that's been built into our culture. Don't look too happy, don't be too happy. You know, let's get going, do your routine, whatever it is. So I gave it a label. I started to call it the enchanted self. I felt that we needed a conceptual label of when we feel whole, integrated, feeling good, not perfect. It doesn't mean our lives are perfect, but we're working internally and externally with our worlds in a way that creates a sense of well-being, that old-fashioned sense of well-being. I feel good today. You know, I'm comfortable with myself. So this is when The Enchanted Self started. The first book, The Enchanted Self, A Positive Therapy, came out about seven or eight years ago now as uh, an academic book, but also for interested readers who have had therapy and have a little sophistication about the mental health field. And interestingly enough, and I take some pride in this, also a little frustration, it came out before the term positive psychology was even being used. My title is The Enchanted Self of Positive Therapy. And I was working, you know, like how someone will invent the telephone and then you hear someone else invented it. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, well, Barbara, that's something we make clear a lot of times. For example, um, positive psychology began in 1998, whereas happiness research began in the 60s. You know, the, mm -hmm. the first happiness increase experiment was in 1977. So there's a whole body of literature that precedes mm -hmm. what we know as positive, positive psychology. Exactly. But there's also those people who came to terms with looking at the flaws and trying to make the correction as psychologists that even were on the before the threshold of the terminology I happen to be one of them but positive psychology as a term term and it basically in its goodwill intent works well for me so I decided that I fit very well in the category since I work with people's optimism, their courage, their hopes, their lost dreams, bringing them back to life. And indeed, I join the crowd. Sure. I'm a positive and psychologist. You're, and you're a happiness coach. Yes, There's another and I'm example. a happiness coach. Mm -hmm. That Because just for what you're saying, that before there was a term even of psychologist, when people went to their priests or people went to the wise woman in the village for help and support, Everyone knew that achieving a state of well-being and feeling purposeful and feeling your life has meaning was what it was all about. We didn't need experts to really put, you know, the full circle around that. Mm -hmm. And so I've been going from there. I was one of the first, I think I might have been the first woman psychologist to have a website about nine years ago. You know, websites were not a million billion then <laughs> and I've just been running ever since because I have this drive you know how sometimes you just know what your purpose is and sometimes you struggle well when I invented that term the enchanted self like the same day I kinda knew for the rest of my life this is my work and my passion that I have a way of presenting mental health within a positive framework and I'm doing it so books keep pouring out and my latest little book delight which is um, a woman's journey really mine back to being Jewish now how does that fit well there was a hole in my heart there's a hole in a lot of women's hearts and men's too when your ethnicity and who you are never gets totally integrated you know or you're forced to go to church five times a week as a kid and it doesn't make any sense to you it can go both ways so when I wrote this, I went out and I traveled in Jewish circles to weddings. I'm thinking of that funny movie that's now, you know, uh -huh. hysterically on the market. Um, wedding Crashers. Wedding Crashers. I kind of crashed in the sense that I barely knew people. I went to weddings. I went to Shabbos's and people's homes. I um, studied with different people. When I went to Israel, I went to see Rabbi Bliskin and spent an hour with him. I just started to open doors. And what I discovered for me is that a lot of the wisdom and the nurturing I was looking for that integrated the enchanted self theories was indeed in Judaism, as well as a personal happiness. Mm -hmm. But when I write, I don't write like someone writes their story. You know, here's my life so far, and I had this boyfriend, I had this happen, I had this husband, you know, this whatever. I write every chapter so that the woman reading Delight at the end of the chapter does her own growth and journeying. Because I'm a teacher at heart, you know, so I have to go that way. And as a teacher, basically, you're, you're saying that you like to look at what's right with people rather than what's wrong. Wouldn't exactly. you say that's a basis of Yes, and that's how teaching? the Seven Gateways started. Yeah, so let's go through them. Yes. You, you, you have seven gateways to happiness that you present. So the first one is like, you know, understanding, recognizing what's right about us versus what's wrong. Let's, let's first begin with perhaps why s most of us or a lot of us have this tendency to see what's wrong rather than what's right. Well, I think that this is a big sociological question, but, you know, so many parents will say things like, oh, I see four Bs, where's the A? You know. Things come down generationally. Uh, we have a society that's a critical society. You open a magazine, here's where the star is dressed in the wrong clothing. You know, it's not enough that you're a star. Who, you know, who cares what you're wearing? But the public cares, and they're going to criticize. So um, we have it everywhere in our culture. We have to rethink and practice 
looking for what's right about ourselves. And I give people certain ways to do that. I suggest they actually make lists of their earlier talents, like pick an age, when you were 10. There must have been something you were good at at 10. Don't, don't stop with the fact that your father yelled at you or uh, your mother told you it was too expensive to collect stamps. I want to know the actual core interest that was in there. I want to know the actual potential. You, you wanted to go away and camp. You loved the outdoors. Your parents were afraid you'd always be six. You didn't even get to be a, a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout. Forget that you didn't get to do it. Now I'm looking for that energy source. I want to ignite it again. And when I work with people and they get to their own energy sources and then we move it forward and we start recreating it or reinventing it, the energy released is like fusion or it's incredible because it's your energy, you know. So that's what the first gateway is all about, helping people train to do that type of release of their own positive energies. Would you say that part of this might be explained as a giving people uh, approval to be happy? I think that that's true, that our society kind of gives a subtle message. It's complicated. Some of the message is a superstitious message. If you look happy or you say you're happy, the sky will fall tomorrow, <laughs> if not now, you know. And some of it is guilt and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Yes, I give approval as a psychologist. You are entitled to be happy, which is exactly what Dr. Bliskin teaches. You know, it's the same core message that we mm -hmm. are here to live lives of meaning and good deeds. How can we do that yeah. if we don't become happy? I know. I, I just want to add that um, in reading uh, Rabbi Pliskin's book, Gateway to Happiness, when I read a particular chapter called Seeking Approval, he, he really... Um, elevated my uh, my being by releasing me and giving me the freedom to no longer not only seek approval but not n to no longer need approval in any in any terms whatsoever and when I when I finally realized that if if happiness is as important as it is and you give it to yourself you've really given yourself in a sense everything you really need so you no longer need the approval because even if you got approval it would never be enough it would just be a trap right right you understand that the very mechanisms of life whether you believe in God or even from a scientific point of view if you just want to stick with the neurons that we are built in such a way that we do everything we need to do in life better when that internal state is capable of being happy. And okay. I'm sure you found that in your research. Uh, oh, biologically. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're, we're yeah. like hedonic creatures. Yeah. We seek pleasure. We avoid pain. That's mm -hmm. our most fundamental, strongest motivation. For good reason. I mean, mm -hmm. we're set up that way. Exactly. It's uh, productive. It, yeah. It's like when we're happier. And this is like um, founded in a whole body of research that as we become happier, we become more productive, we earn more money, we, our relationships improve. There are so many benefits to our right, happiness. Right, right. And practice, practice, practice. People will say to me, well, gee, you know, that kind of sounds kind of hard. You've taught me all these gateways, that's kind of hard. And I'll say, well, isn't it kind of hard to feel miserable? Did you ever notice how lousy you feel when you feel miserable? <laughs> you know, you're dragging around, you can hardly do your chores, you drop everything, you forget where you left your glasses. You know, is that pleasant? No. Do you think, you know, sometimes I've asked myself, how could people be unhappy now that I've been living a life of happiness? Do you think that part of being unhappy is being unconscious, not aware? Are you saying that, like, being numbed down or mishypnotized by our world? That, that, that's certainly uh, a part of it? It's part of uh -huh. it. It's part of it. Well, I've heard statements to the effect that only a conscious person can be happy. In other yes. words, it takes a certain amount it of takes consciousness. It work. Yeah. And let's, uh, I'll tell you the next gateway is real and... Okay. That's a very good one. That's really good. Uh, and it ties into the second gateway of finding a story in line in your life, making yourself your own hero or heroine. We all need to feel 
that our life has purpose and that God forbid the divorce or the illness or the lost child or whatever it was was not for naught. We mm -hmm. need to build a story where we mm -hmm. are the hero or the heroine, where we've learned certain things, we've grown, we met certain people, we gave others certain opportunities. And I find that, again, our culture, because we're a cosmetic culture tied into the rich and famous, you know, the ordinary person who sustained a divorce and has a learning disabled kid and schleps around with two jobs and whatever, she says, what story? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm barely surviving. But if you start to help her understand that she's almost like a queen within a small dynasty of running errands, getting her kids places on time, cooking a de decent supper for her family, trying to re-engage socially, maybe taking care of an aging parent, taking care of the dog that the kids wanted and who takes care of it, you know, whatever it is, that her life indeed it has fabric and it's beginning to show a design. So in your, in your practice, um, then you encourage your clients to then rephrase their story, to re-express it, not from the problems, not from the deficiencies, from the ways where they're not doing as well as they ca could, but from the, how they're actually succeeding. Absolutely, and, and how they want to succeed. Right. And that ties into the third gateway because we do have a problem, again, in our society that people don't know how to meet their needs and how to succeed. Again, if you can't make it to college or you get crushed in your first job or whatever happens, you're married with two babies, you don't make it past junior college one semester, whatever it is, then we go into this like paralysis. I don't know how to do that. And this won't work because that won't work and this won't work and to help people understand there's a method to succeeding and there's a method to getting your needs met for a woman asking for a raise where she works in the public library it may not be going in and crying to the director and looking pathetic even though that worked with daddy maybe 28 years ago it may mean getting some statistics of what current salaries are for librarians and being a mensch and sitting down with some numbers and asking for a fair shot at, you know, being paid in contemporary wages. Barbara, you know, sometimes, like, we bring this up a lot, you know, um, there are a lot of things we want. Sometimes we want more money, we want a better position, a certain kind of a job and all. But, you know, according to the research, according to 40 years of research, making more money above the poverty line, success, advanced degrees, all these things that we tend to want generally don't um, end up making us happier. So do you also kind of like try to tune in your clients to the fact that, <laughs> you know, while you're trying to achieve yes, what you yes. want, you should be trying for the... Well, you just leaped to my next game, oh, right? Okay. Great, great. <laughs> wow, okay, you're so excellent. good, you're so good. <laughs> okay, because we have to go ahead to replenishment and happiness on a daily basis and not running on empty. If you think you're going to go to graduate school and work night and day also being a gas, gas attendant and checkout girl or whatever, and then you think you're going to flower, you have a mistake. You know, all of this has to be balanced with daily replenishment and what makes you happy, what gives you some peace of mind, a sense of well-being. Now, I don't know if you find this, but see, I find when my clients and the women who write to me on the web, they often have forgotten what gives them pleasure. They get so downtrodden that you actually have to go through a relearning process. Oh, yeah, I did like the opera, or I did sing in the chorus, and I loved music when I was a kid. Yeah, I, I sort of like to um, go out for a nice dinner. I really, I just got so used to eating hot dogs when we go to see the ball game for our kid. You know, it's, again, that sort of hypnotic thing that takes over people. So I work a lot on giving people permission to find their pleasures again. And I'm glad you mentioned that it was a daily thing. Daily. Uh, it's probably even more than daily, but certainly I agree, daily. I agree. I, I, think, I think it, it almost needs to be in every 
choice yes. you make. Yes, when I was driving up here, I had this wonderful reverie. I was thinking about this house that I don't have. <laughs> I was furbishing it, you know, with uh -huh. beautiful wood floors and windows with open to the breeze and no allergy stuff and, you know, windows <laughs> just with gorgeous light curtains and this kitchen that was so equipped. I actually was like almost reaching a sort of elation state lasted about 15, 20 minutes, and then it, you know, didn't have the same life to it anymore, so I put on the radio. Mm -hmm. But see, that's practice. Mm -hmm. um, and now to the last three gateways, briefly. Okay. Um, the fifth gateway is um, is uh, not isolating, finding the right groups. This is mm. a real tough one because um, it's fun, but it's tough. Because we do, particularly women, if we're not feeling happy, we'll withdraw. Now, I think men may have other habits, more like uh, road, road rage and some other stuff that happens, but women, we tend to withdraw, so we don't make a phone call when we should make a phone call to get in touch with someone. Uh, we need the right communities. If you're in the wrong place, and of course, AA teaches this brilliantly. You know, when you need to grow and change, you can't expect the wrong people to be right for you. So as we become more equipped to have states of happiness, we have to also have the right communities, whatever that means. It doesn't mean you have to get rid of people in your life. It, a community might be an online group you share with. It might be a book you're reading. Happiness Club? Except hap Okay, see, that's the perfect thing, like the Happiness Club. Absolutely. Some way that reinforces what you're doing. Is that the reason we had, we used to have many, many, many more women than men, but now the men are really catching up? More women in what? In the Happiness Club. For five and a half years wow. in the beginning, it was just women. And now there's more men. Oh, and, and, they're, and they're pretty knowledgeable now. Wow. So they're, they're, they're learning from the women. We're catching maybe. on, yeah. <laughs> I like <laughs> that. I yeah. like that. I don't want to, you know, because we're actually amazingly running out of time, oh. I want to keep you on track with the gateways because yes. I find them okay. fascinating. The sixth gateway is mentoring and being mentored. We tend, wow. We tend to not recognize the amount of wisdom we have stored inside of ourselves. And we tend to think that a mentor or going for help, you have to find you know, some person you're going to pay $100 an hour to or whatever. You know, a tree could be a mentor. If you just sit by that tree and watch at some natural level how it is able to be there and just solid and whatever, a neighbor may be a mentor if you watch them walking their dog and how they pace themselves. Yes, there are great, brilliant minds that are mentors also. You may have the capacity to mentor it may be a child down the street, it may be a girlfriend or a wife, a husband, a friend, and releasing again that energy. What can you offer? Which leads me to the last, and of course... But, may I interrupt for a moment? I mean, I find, I just want to add uh, and, and throw in one, one point. Amazingly, George and I really were talking about the mentoring part of the, ga the gateway you're talking about. All of a sudden, uh, we had a profound, uh, well, with George's help, a lot of times we get together, but we came up with one more need in either a happiness club or as a group, and that was uh, a sponsor or a partner or even a friend, and we, we were starting to think in terms of mentoring or getting people together to support one another. In, in happiness. And you raised that as a gateway, which That's I find right. amazing because we were right. just talking That's about right. this very thing. It's critical. I'm delighted you're working on that. And I, mm -hmm. I can't, I like to stay yeah, cause posted. Because the idea also is a lot of times, you know, these partnerships, these relationships are very, very productive, but sometimes they have to be organized, they have to be structured that's into right. our lives. That's and so right. that's the benefit of doing that, you know, having it as a part that's, that's, that's like mandated, that's kind of like, you know. Well, AA sure. couldn't exist without their well, own we were Well, we were talking about you know. that very thing specifically, yeah. and I find it amazing you bring it up yes, as your gateway. Yes, yes. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so, Carry on. And then the seventh gateway, which is the all-purpose gateway, and again ties into really all the major religions of the world, all the great spiritual thoughts, is that if in doubt, and when you feel lousy, and when you feel good, 
Can you still do something good? Can you do a good deed? Can you be kind? Can you at least say that your life has purpose and meaning at this moment because instead of shoving someone, maybe you let them get in front of you. You know, you were nice to someone. You gave them a smile that perked up their day. You know, nothing is ever guaranteed that because you smiled at someone that you're now happy. Although the research does support the more often we smile and give out, the more we feel all the good neurons clicking off and stuff inside ourselves and we do feel very much better. But I have this notion of the universe that, um, you know, that you may give to someone and someone else will give to you 10 years later. What difference does it make? You know, this, as long as the energy gets released. And also, a lot of times, it's, um, we give to others, but a lot of times, especially when we're not feeling as good as we feel we should, it is a very good thing to be good to ourselves. Our first pri priority at that point very often should be to get ourselves to the point where we're feeling good enough to right. really contribute. Right. Oh, I wanted to show, this is why I wore this necklace. I knew I wore it for a reason. This necklace, um, I don't know, I think she's it's getting beautiful. it. Um, a gal wrote to me through my website, EnchantedSelf.com, and she lives in South Africa, and my stuff inspired her to go back and complete some care for herself that she needed to do, to take care of herself first. And in the process of going back for that, um, she got the courage to start back on her crafts, which involved partly beading, and so she sent me this necklace. Yeah, so beautiful. it was really a full circa circle. I, I noticed that you just said uh, to take care of herself first. And I was, we just had a meeting at the Happiness Club uh, this past Thursday. And one of the things we were talking about is happiness is a decision. And I said, you have to make happiness come first. You have to make yourself come first. And I gave the illustration that if you're in an airplane and there's a disaster mm -hmm. and, and the airbags fall, right. what do they tell you to, what do they direct you to do? Put the airbag on yourself first, then put it on your child. Right. Why is that? Because if you're not maintaining a balance within yourself, you're no good to anyone, including yourself. Exactly. I teach this all the time. Women are very depleted and very often literally running on empty you know, because they are so concerned to keep their children well and stuff like that. Th this is it's great that you're doing this. We're I, actually oh, out, of out of time. We have two seconds okay. for you to give your website. Absolutely. www.enchantedself.com. That's one word, Enchanted Self. I have a free email newsletter, sign up, classes. And I do have an 877 number, 877B, the letter B is in boy, joyful, J-O-Y-F-U-L. And I would love to hear from you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so Barbara much. Holstein. Well, that's all we have time for today. Tune in next time. Bye-bye. Happiness is powerful. It's our underlying need. Happiness is why we live each day. Happiness is destiny. So let's be so very happy. Yeah, let's be so very happy. Let's be so very happy